Hey there. If you have already heard this, please skip forward. This is the intro description to the video parts for a page on my website. The page you are likely viewing this on will teach the basics of how to read the different types of plots and seismic charts people use. If there is anything I can add or any mistakes to be corrected, please do not hesitate to contact me. To aid people who have a harder time reading or just those who would rather watch a video, I am adding video versions to the different sections on my read, spectrogram, seismic plots, and more page, which resides under the how to drop down menu on my website. If you are viewing this on YouTube, please scroll to the description box below and click the link to the page. And here we are back to a different section on this page. Remember how to drop down menu, read spectrogram, seismic plots, and more. Here we have how to read a spectrogram plot. Spectrogram plots are a very cool looking type of seismological analysis and are virtually very simple to understand. You can see them in many places including YouTube live streams such as Spectronet, KiwiQuakes, or Orange Ribbon Hope and websites such as unavco.org. They can be very colorful and when showing large earthquakes they really do captivate the eye much more so than seismogram plots. However, despite their cool look, they do not bring the full potential required for full seismological analysis. I do think spectrograms are extremely important, but they cannot be used all by themselves when trying to understand the cause of any given event. For example, if you were trying to locate an earthquake's epicenter, you would then be given a few things to do, including determining the P and S wave arrivals for at, three, at least three neighboring seismic stations for the event in question. You cannot do that with spectrograms alone. Before I start, are any of you relying solely on the UNAVCO spectrograms, one shown here? Are you frustrated that you are constrained to only the data and time frame that you are seeing? Well, downloading seismic data and analyzing the spectrograms are very easy to do and you can manipulate them any way you want. It doesn't actually manipulate the data, but you can change the time frames all the way down to a few seconds instead of 24 hours like you see here, which is much too long of a time frame. Again, Analyzing the spectrograms are pretty easy if you understand the chart labels. Don't anyone tell you that it is not, because it is. I rarely use the UNAVCO spectrograms anymore, if at all. They are far too basic, they don't show enough frequency range, and show too long of a time frame within too small of a window. Plus, you cannot even manipulate the way the spectrogram looks to suit your needs for what you are trying to discover. It is time that you started to create your own spectrograms, but first you need to understand them. Before I start, I want to say that PNSN has their own spectrograms too. I find that they are way better than the UNAVCO type of spectrograms, but they are still not as good as being able to manipulate the spectrograms any way you wish in seismic analysis programs. To visit the PNSN spectrogram play page, excuse me, please click here, and also please click here to view the great explanation PNSN gives on spectrograms. And I do show one of the UNAVCO spectrograms, which to me are basically useless now. Remember this four channel spectrogram plot is generated from the seismic strain meters or possibly the seismometers. Note in the image below, right here, how it says strain meters detect deformation, not melt percentage or depth, or even gas output. Laser strain meters are long baseline on the order of 0.5 kilometers. Measurements of deformation on the Earth's surface. Borehole instrumentation is grouted in place 100 to 200 meters below ground. And borehole strain meters measure crustal deformation. Borehole strain meters, again, detect crustal deformation on a time scale of less than a second to weeks or months. The seismometers obviously detect seismic waves at periods of several minutes or less, just like any other seismometer. Then they have poor pressure sensors and tilt meters, which we already know about. So if the strain meters, or the spectrograms from the strain meters, detect gas or melt percentage or depth, then how come it doesn't say it right here? Well, you could say, hey, maybe they're lying. Well, if they were lying about this, why would they show any data at all? That doesn't even make any sense. But again, I know this for a fact because I have seen strain meters that don't even have to do with Yellowstone and other areas of the United States and the world. It's not just Yellowstone that use strain meters, guys. And again, crustal deformation, you can click this button right here to go to the page of the UNAVCO instruments shown above to see all of the instruments that UNAVCO hosts. Again, above we see an example of the UNAVCO spectrograms. Specific instruments set out by UNAVCO within the borehole casings cannot detect types of gas or melt percentage slash depth, as some people state. If the spectrograms could show any type of depth characteristic, then the label on the left would have to be, I'm saying would have to be depth, 
not frequency millihertz MHZ. Note in the image I posted under the UNAVCO spectrogram plots, again, it says strain meters measure crustal deformation. In other words, strain meters detect the same change of the Earth, like GPS and tilt instruments do, but in a different way. And the UNAVCO four-channel spectrograms are likely generated from these strain meters, or possibly also from the borehole seismometers, which actually contain way more than four channels. Although understanding gas composition is a very key component to volcano monitoring, any volcano that sees unrest will not just put out gas. There will be many more signs associated to the unrest that is taking place. Plus, any degassing would possibly cause low-frequency earthquakes signaling the resonance of the gas itself. Kind of like what my uh, one of my viewers has recently said, which actually makes a lot of sense. Think of a pipe organ, how it kind of resonates through the pipes. Kind of like that. However, the time between the beginning of the unrest to the time of the beginning of the eruption can vary greatly and sometimes offer little warning. Let me know if you have found an accurate source for gas monitoring at Yellowstone. So far, I haven't found any, but I do know it exists, but I don't understand why it is so hard to find. But we do know UNAVCO does not host any gas instruments at all and of course the vertical wise up here like let's say some people say oh if the line is up here the line of melt depth or percentage is pretty high and then let's say it went down here then they say it's lower right well if that has to do with melt depth then why does it say frequency on the left it, it has nothing to do with depth at all because these are spectrograms Spectrograms do not record that, These, especially seismic spectrograms, guys. These are seismic spectrograms, kind of like the ones seen on Spectronet or the PNSN website or the, even the ones that I generate from Swarm. But these are, I'll show you why in just a second. I, I don't like these anymore, guys. They, the settings they have on them are too ridiculous. So, in regards to the UNAVCO spectrogram shown here, did you notice how vertically it shows a label of frequency? Please note, it says frequency, MHZ on the left, and zero, right here, and 500, right here. Well, that means the data shown shows only a frequency range of 0, 0.0 hertz to 0 0.5 hertz. The label MHZ, please note, the small m means millihertz. Seriously, guys, don't take my word for it. Look it up yourself. That still means the maximum frequency recorded vertically is 0 0.5 hertz. That is barely enough frequency range to show any type of volcanic or tectonic activity. Even harmonic tremor rarely dips below 0 0.5 hertz. And then I do have a link right here. It says click here to see a video about that. I do have a video about harmonic tremor and what it actually looks like. Therefore, these spectrograms are really only good for seeing distant earthquakes, which are teleseisms, microseisms, which contain frequencies below 0.5 Hz, and the beginning frequencies of some types of earthquakes. Also, notice horizontally it records time period as well. See, time, hours. Notice from 0 to 24, and again, those are hour marks, guys. Yeah, way too long of a time frame to really see anything of value since most volcanic events, even tectonic events, occur above 0 0.5 hertz and rarely last longer than a few minutes or hours. But even if something's more long drawn out, the, the more data that you have constrained into an image, let's say you have 10 minutes of data, you're gonna see a lot of detail. When well, let's say you have 10 hours of data in that same size of an image, it will look very, very small, much smaller guys. For example, a lot of harmonic tremor episodes have occurred between 0 0.5 hertz and five hertz, but that obviously slightly varies. Now, what is the color? Well, some people on YouTube and other places have suggested the color change is associated with gas output. That is very clever and easy to assume since UNAVCO doesn't even give a good explanation as to what the public is viewing when using these spectrograms. I always haven't found a good explanation from UNAVCO yet, but PNSN does give a great explanation as to what seismic spectrograms are. Link already shown earlier on this page. However, guys, if you read chart labels and look at the instruments they provide, it's kind of easy to understand where they're coming from. Now, how can color change be associated with anything else but frequency power, since the main recordings are in MHZ, right here, frequency, MHZ, which is a frequency label. Of course, I could be wrong. However, UNAVCO does not host any gas spectrometers, which would be required to create gas spectrograms. 
In the seismic program swarm, among many other programs that can create spectrograms, the color is always power, dB. But since these spectrograms are generated possibly from the strain meters, which record deformation, it is possible the color change between channels is associated to the strength of the deformation and that the power of the frequency range has been removed. But we already know that they do not host any gas instruments whatsoever. However, hopefully someday that changes and I am emailing people trying to find gas readings for Yellowstone. But it almost seems like people are saying they don't exist. But Yellowstone is so gassy, guys, it has to exist. Now again, power is how strong the frequency was when it occurred, and the vertical frequency range gives us of an idea how the event in question took place. This is why spectrogram plots, in conjunction with spectra and waveform plots, are very powerful. Another possibility people give is that the UNAVCO spectrograms show the depth of the melt at Yellowstone. How can that be when any activity that occurs vertically is shown to be associated with frequency content, usually in hertz, but here it's millihertz. This is frequency content, guys. It cannot show depth. This is showing that right here would be 0 0.000000 hertz, right? Up here would be 500 millihertz, which is also 0 0.5 hertz. So vertically, if this is frequency, then this obviously cannot be any type of melt depth. That's impossible then. That's impossible. But really, we're already armed with the fact that any magma intrusion event at all will always create an earthquake swarm. So we're already armed with that fact. Again, if it were to show anything related to depth at all, the label on the left would not say hertz or millihertz, but would have to. And I'm talking have to. This is how charts work and how our math teachers, even in grade school, taught us this, guys. That it would have to have some type of depth range in kilometers or miles. So we know for sure this does not show depth. Also, there are some people stating the color change is not power or gas output, but is magma intrusion? This is simply not true. You cannot say magma intrusion is occurring just by looking at a simple spectrogram, even one that is too simple like the UNAVCO spectrograms. Magma intrusion will always carry an earthquake swarm with it, simply because of how powerful magma is, and how powerful rock and dense earth pressure is from above. Plus, magma itself can create its own signals, such as low-frequency earthquakes, harmonic and volcanic tremor, etc. If magma intrusion were to occur, much like it did during the 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake event, it would create a good-sized volcano tectonic VT swarm with low-frequency background tremor or low-frequency earthquakes, possibly even creating hybrid earthquakes showing a mixture of magma resonance and brittle rock failure, kind of like what we saw again in the 2008-2009 dike intrusion of Yellowstone Lake. For an example of that, go to my website, go to the Seismic Events drop-down menu, and click 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake. Now, those parameters are not required line by line, of course, and magma intrusion, also called magma injection, can occur in a multitude of ways, actually. However, magma is not peaceful, guys, meaning it will cause an earthquake swarm at the least. That is for sure. But the biggest question that people ask themselves is, how much time will we have between a large earthquake swarm and a possible eruption at Yellowstone? I don't know. That is one thing to watch out for. That's why whenever you see a swarm at Yellowstone or even Long Valley or another super volcano, don't blow it out of proportion too much. Just analyze it and see what's going on. But again, guys, if I do see a sign of an eruption, I'm not going to be quiet about it because that is what pretty much what I'm dedicated to doing. That is the number one thing that I started out doing was monitoring Yellowstone for possible precursor eruption signs. And I have learned a lot as to what those precursor signs look like. And plus, some of the data on my website here in the Seismic Events drop-down menu for multiple events can actually aid you in sort of seeing what some precursor signs look like because I do have some volcanic events on my website here. These spectrogram plots I'm showing here are taken from the Seismic Program Swarm. Of course, there are other seismic analysis programs that show spectrograms a little differently, but the overall understanding of spectrograms will be accomplished, and plus, Swarm puts out the best spectrograms I have seen so far. Below is an image of one earthquake, and it's right here. One earthquake on a spectrogram. I show four incremental stages of this earthquake to show you the importance of reading labels and the importance of reading the time period at the bottom so that you understand how the look of an earthquake can change in regards to time period. Remember how the UNAVCO spectrograms show 24 hours within a very small plot? You see that right here? Okay, remember 24 hours within a plot that's a little bit wider than the plots that I just showed down here. 
Well, how then would the earthquake below, right here, ever be shown on the UNAVCO spectrograms? It wouldn't, except for a tiny, almost invisible spike. So, check this out. Look at this, guys. You see this is one earthquake with inc four incremental steps zooming out. Notice this? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then finally, we have it looking like this. It makes it look extremely tiny, right? Well, look at the time frame right here. 524 UTC. 540 so what like maybe 25 30 minutes that's half of an hour guys so let's just say half hour a half of an hour versus 24 hours so that means a spike like this you see this teeny tiny spike right here on the unavco spectrograms look at that so that could be a large earthquake guys but then again the frequencies are a little too low i only think that when you see an earthquake on the UNAVCO spectrograms, I believe they will mainly be teleseisms because earthquakes do have frequencies going down to 0 0.5 hertz, maybe a little bit lower, yes. But most of the time they don't. And if you don't believe me, just take some data and analyze their frequency range in the seismic program swarm or a different seismic program if you wish. But just analyze their frequency range and see where the frequency starts of the earthquake and where the frequency stops. So again, this was taken from Seismic Station MCID with data retrieved from October 12th, 2017. First, I would like you to notice the main event you see is the same exact earthquake in each increment. The Seismic Program Swarm aided me in the creation of this four, yeah, four plot image. Notice how when you zoom out, the earthquake gets smaller, 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 and smaller. This is simply because when you add more time to the same sized plot, and this goes for all plots, the data will look smaller and smaller. The last spectrogram in the example is about 25 minutes long. Now if a large earthquake looks this small in about a 25 minute time frame, then how small would, would it look in a 24 hour time frame? Much like the UNAVCO spectrogram plots? The UNAVCO spectrograms are 24 hours long compared to the largest time frame here of 25 minutes. That is why I do not use the UNAVCO spectrograms. I suggest if you want to start using spectrograms to monitor volcanic, tectonic, or hydrothermal activity at Yellowstone, Long Valley, or other volcanoes, then you really should learn how to download seismic data and analyze it in Swarm or another seismic program of your choice that provides spectrogram plots along with waveform plots as well. Remember, though, that spectrogram analysis by itself is not too helpful, but can be very powerful if used in conjunction with waveforms. WYYLT01, short period vertical, July 5th, 2018, rapid succession swarm. Here's an example right here. Now, the above spectrogram plots right here are from the rapid succession earthquake swarm that occurred at West Thumb, Yellowstone on July 5th, 2018. The two spectrograms are for the same exact time period. The difference between the two spectrograms is only that the top one carries a frequency range of 0 to 25 hertz. Now, the bottom spectrogram carries only a frequency range of 0 to 10 hertz. Notice the drastic difference? This is done to prove to you that reading chart labels before you read the data is paramount when analyzing seismic data. And notice how, of course, we do have some much lower frequencies. This probably went down to probably 0 0.5 hertz or so, but notice how they don't really go down past 1 hertz much at all. You notice that? So really, if you were to use the UNAVCO spectrogram to look at these earthquakes, you most likely would have never seen them. Spectrograms are very easy to read. Again, seismic spectrograms only record frequency, time period, and power. Frequency is labeled on the left vertically, and time period is labeled at the bottom horizontally. The color range is usually power, labeled as dB in swarm, ranging from blue, weakest, to red, strongest. These three important aspects of spectrograms are often very overlooked, and they can be directly manipulated in any way that you wish via the seismic program swarm. Remember, the data itself is never manipulated, but only the way it appears. This gives you the freedom to conduct in-depth analysis of any event you wish in any way you wish. The small image right here is from the program swarm and shows the settings for the spectrogram analysis window. Notice how you can manipulate the spectrograms in any way you wish. See where it says power range DB? When changed, this will manipulate how the color range looks on the spectrograms. The power range is recorded in decibels. Let's show you an example. The spectrograms here show the same time period for the original spectrogram that I posted just above the settings image for the July 5th, 2018 West Thumb Yellowstone Earthquake Swarm. Now notice there are three spectrograms within this window here. Notice that? 
The first spectrogram has a decibel power range of 0, 0.0 to 120. The middle spectrogram has a power range of 30 to 120. And the last spectrogram has a power range of 60 to 120 decibels. Notice the drastic change. Remember the color scales from blue weakest to red strongest. Notice how, again, the color range is directly correlated to the power. Well, that is it for now for learning how to read spectrogram plots. I hope this helped some of you understand the basics and helped others understand that this stuff is a lot easier than some would want you to believe. Chart labels help out a lot. Want to monitor the world? Well, you can do it all yourself in the comfort of your own home. And it is not just live streaming data that you can view, but any data since the early 2000s. Did I forget to add something to the spectrogram guide? Please feel free to let me know. Next up is learning about seismogram plots, sometimes called waveform plots. Please scroll down now if you are viewing this on my website.